Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I see we already have quite a few people here. Uh, we'll get started in just a moment, but if you get a chance, tell me in the chat where you are joining us from. Minnesota, but it's cool there today. And I am in St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, we've had a very cold couple of weeks, so I'm grateful that it's sunny and a little warmer today. Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, great. I will go ahead and load my slides here. Um, would love to know, got a few other people, so don't be shy, tell me where you're from. I am really hopeful you'll be active in the chat today because uh, I want to make this uh, session as, as you know, engaging and as helpful as I can for you. So right off, I'll let you know I want your questions, I want your comments, uh, and I'll do my best to uh, keep engaging you along the way. Cricky, you're a, a, a neighbor here in St. Pete. That's really cool. I don't usually get many locals when I, when I present. Well, anyway, let's dive into it. I know we're at time. Um, welcome to Emerging Leaders. We're going to talk today about cultivating skills for career. If you're here thinking about becoming a leader or interested in leadership, this is for you uh, and your career growth. And if you're already a leader, then this is about how do you identify and help develop and engage new leaders. So would love to, I plan to help you on both and I'd love again to hear where you're, where you're coming from. So great. Oh, another local Jan, San Antonio isn't far away either, just a little north of Tampa. And Vermont, oh, wonderful. All right, well, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping to let you know who we are, who I am, and what makes us uh, credible, I guess you would say, to uh, join the webinar today. First of all, I wanna thank MSO for having us. The Omnia Group is a, a regular, consistent presenter at MSO webinars, and we really appreciate our partnership and the business your community brings us. We have been around since 1985. We are based in Tampa, Florida. And uh, our goal is to help leaders reduce the stress. It's one of the biggest jobs or the biggest stressors if you are in leadership to hire and retain your people. And our goal is to help reduce that, str that stress. And the primary way we do that is through our behavioral assessment and a cognitive assessment. And these assessments help you uh, select the right candidates, and then identify who are the best candidates to promote and grow from within. And also, we provide ways to engage and develop and motivate your staff. And again, all of that comes in the form of our reports we provide once your employees or even you, which we'll talk about, complete our assessments. Uh, and also, we do it through these kinds of services. We provide a lot of webinars, articles, blogs. We produce a blog every week on Mondays that gets posted on social media and shared with our clients on a monthly summary of just things that are going on when it comes to finding, developing, and engaging your talent to get the most out of them, we address those needs. So love doing it. And that leads you to who am I and why am I here doing this? Um, I'm Kather Snyder. I am the president and chief operating officer of the Omnia Group. I joined four years ago. I started uh, in heading up sales, marketing, and customer success, and was promoted to president and COO last March. Um, I love leading people, and I love helping organizations get the most out of their people. So I've been in this uh, industry. I've been working in all areas and facets of the employee life cycle and interpersonal relationships my entire career, uh, which spans more than 30 years now, which is crazy. Um, but I love this topic. You, I think you'll see my passion as we get into it. So let's go ahead and dig in. What we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to be a little all over the board because, again, I want to mix it up. But I promise you, by the end of this session, we will have uncovered some influential communication techniques to use. We will talk about team development and understanding the stages of team development and how that plays in to team building team engagement, productivity, and how it impacts where the leader needs to engage. We're going to talk about empowering and developing your team. And then if you are a person looking at becoming a leader, how do you switch from that me role to the we role? Because at the essence, that's what leadership is all about. So we'll span all these topics. And again, 
I will gladly take your questions in the chat. I keep an eye on that the whole way through. And um, I also had some questions submitted before the webinar that I plan to address in most of the content. And then some of it I'll do at the end. So my first question for you, and I would love it if you would put in the chat a one, if you are currently an individual contributor interested in maybe jumping into the leadership realm, or if two, you are currently leading a team. I'd like to know based on the, the number of people we have today, who's already doing it and who's thinking about it. This is really helpful, thank you. So far, I've got currently leading teams. Do I have any individual contributors out there thinking about it? This will shape the way I talk about today. <laughs> leading, 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 leading. Okay, so most of you, oh, here we go, Cricky, individual contributor, maybe thinking about putting your toe in the water. Great, thank you all for participating. This really helps. Great, so we do have a few individual contributors who must have joined because you're thinking about it. Are you? Equipped, ready, do you want to do it? What are the pitfalls? Some of those things. So, all right, I will. It's pretty balanced. Thank you. I will make sure I address this both ways. And if there's ever a time where you feel like I'm focusing too much on leaders already versus individual contributor, please keep me honest, ask me a question uh, and, uh, and help me out. But my goal is to help each of you walk away uh, with tools, resources, and ideas. So if you're looking to grow your team, engage your team better, identify new leaders, this will help you. And if you are thinking about getting into leadership or maybe you've decided already and you just want some tips and tools, this will be for you as well. So Phil Jackson, uh, I read the book Shoe Dog last year and uh, absolutely love that book. And it is a great leadership and business executives book, by the way, it's Nike founder. Um, and uh, actually, I'm totally wrong. Phil Jackson is the coach of the Bulls. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still talking about shoe dog and thinking Phil Knight. Excuse me. All right, Phil Jackson, Chicago Bulls. And the funny thing is I grew up a Pistons fan, so I was never like a Bills fan, so maybe I'm in denial. But I love this quote, and you're going to realize this is my style. I laugh at myself, which I think is an important trait of leaders. But Phil Jackson said, the strength of the team is each individual member and the strength of each member is our team so one of the first things i always talk to leaders about is the more you can get your team engaged and helping each other and building that community building those bonds no one person can get it all done it takes all types it takes all experiences it takes all backgrounds diversity all those things and the stronger we are is when we work together and build our own strengths and then leverage those strengths as a team so love the quote, don't always remember who said it. And what it all comes down to, if you're leading people or if you are a team member, is you need to care about every single one of the people that you work with or and you lead, both. So it really comes down to understanding each individual and how you get the most out of them, how you help and support each other and creating a unified goal and getting the work done. And let's face it, we're all being asked to do so many different things in today's world. Technology is flying at us at a rate we've never seen. We're all having to adapt new skills and we need each other to do it. And we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. Nobody shows up at work any day perfect, 100% perfect or 100% capable to do the job. So what it all comes down to is knowing each other, knowing your people, and, and leveraging those strengths and caring. I like to say, I wrote a whole blog on care and what it means and why it's so important to care. So this leads me to the topic of employee engagement and why it matters. And the first thing when I think about employee engagement is really understanding where people are. And if you're as old as I am, or if you've been around as long as I am, you're, you might be going Maslow, really? She's bringing up Maslow. Um, but I still believe this is one of the fundamental concepts when it comes to getting to understand people and where they are. And we all are at various degrees of needs given our circumstances and the day. So we go back and forth on these. So for those of you not familiar, Abraham Maslow is the world's leading psychologist in human behavior. And in 1943, so yes, we're going on almost 100 years here, folks, but he published this research on the hierarchy of needs. And basically it was 
that if you don't have your basic needs met, you don't care about the higher level needs. And that's why it's important to understand this as a leader. And even sometimes when we're, when we're taking a check on our own pulse and where we stand. So I'll go through these really quickly. And they do, they go from the ground up and they work in a hierarchy. So the very first most important set of needs and individual needs are physiological needs. Those are needs like personal security, um, water, food, bare necessities. So I have something to eat, I have something to drink, and I'm in a place where I feel secure. And that leads you to safety. So if I'm hungry, I don't have water, I don't have natural resources, that's my first worry. Safety comes second. That's security, resources, income, money coming in, being able to cover basic expenses, um, structure, order, those are all uh, safety, safety needs. Once those are met, so I'm fed, I have an income, I'm meeting my budget, I can you know, take care of myself on a daily basis. The next thing that's gonna be important is that love and belonging. Do I have a social circle? Do I have friendships? Do I have community? And most important, do I feel like I belong in that community? And quite honestly, this is when we just start getting into the workforce. This is when it now becomes important that I care about who I work with. I care about those. I want to belong. I want to feel like I fit in here. Um, but if I don't have water, food, money, I could give a care about who I'm working with. I just want to make sure I'm getting the basic needs met. If that makes sense, hopefully it does. Um, then we build up again to esteem. And esteem are things like dignity, respect, achievement, purpose, being recognized for our talents. This is when we start building confidence and competence, and we have a sense of high self-esteem because we're doing well. We're doing well in our work. We're doing well in our community. We're doing well in our friendship circles and our family and our career. Once we've met that level, we're ready to move on to self-actualization, which is the ultimate need of a human being. And honestly, there's a lot of people walking on this earth who will never get to that point because those bottom level needs aren't met again. But if they are, and I promise you have people in your workforce that have, have met those needs and are ready for self-actualization. And what that means is they're ready, and maybe some of you are too, ready to create, explore, be more independent, have some freedom, uh, use skills, maybe try skills you've never used before because you're looking for that ultimate uh, need to be met where you are fully confident, fully competent, and want more. And you're able to go get more because everything else is being met. You feel strong in your community. You feel like you found your place. You found your people. You're making a good living. So you're willing to take some risks. Maybe you've got some stuff stocked away. So why is this important when it comes to employee engagement? What happens uh, for those of us in Florida? What happens every fall? We usually get a hurricane, right? Or the threat of a hurricane. And when that happens, we all go back down to physiological and safety needs. That's the most important thing. So I'm not in my most creative state or looking for new challenges when we got a hurricane burning down on us and I'm worried about my house, I'm worried about my pets, my children, my safety, all of those things. So temporarily we can go back down on this hierarchy of needs and different things matter. So that's kind of a common one. We get ready for it. We're, we have hurricane preparedness. We probably don't stay in that place very long, but if disaster hits those who aren't prepared and ready, it can take longer to come out of that state. Um, I've worked with people who unfortunately their houses have burned down or they've had a major safety event in their family. Someone's life was put at risk or they were robbed. Again, that's when we're falling down that hierarchy. And until that person gets through that scenario, very rarely will they be able to think of anything else. And why I'm bringing this up and I'll move on is it's really important we know our people and it's really important we know our colleagues and identify and understand what's going on um, when, when these things are happening. So, and again, I'll just say, case in point, hurricane season, we start putting out all sorts of notifications to our clients because our team is always affected if it's burrowing down on Florida. And uh, we accommodate our employees to get ready for those, uh, to take time to prepare their homes, go do the shopping, maybe leave. Um, it's just what you need to do as a company and it's becoming even more important. And in the insurance industry, you have clients 
customers facing this every single year as well. So it's just something to be mindful of where you are with your teams and where you are with your clients. So by the numbers, why does this matter to have engaged employees and understand our employees? The key is um, that it matters to your business. Um, highly engaged organizations drive 23% more in profitability. Engaged companies with engaged employees have 41% less mistakes, 41% lower absenteeism, and a 59% reduction in turnover. So engagement isn't just a nice to have, a good to have, it matters. But here's the facts. Gallup, uh, the Gallup company launches an employee engagement survey every single year. And I follow this survey every single year. I'm a nerd when it comes to this. And I'm concerned. I, I, it just always breaks, literally breaks my heart when I read the stats because the engagement data is very low. And what that means is that there are a lot of people going to work every day who are not fully caring about how well they do their work, how much, how good they show up, how much they put into it. What the data says, and this is 2024's uh, or 2023's report, it comes out every spring, um, that last year in 2023, only 33% of the workforce was actively engaged, meaning they're coming to work, they care about where they work, who they work, what, work for, work with, and they're giving over 100%. They're giving their all most days. That's what active engagement means. On the flip side of that, I'm going to go to the other extreme, 17%. Almost 20% of the workforce is actively disengaged. Now, these are the people that are coming to work every day and trying to take people down with them, or maybe even worse, sabotage your business, treat your clients poorly. They're doing things to cut the brand, the culture of your team. These are your toxic employees. Know who they are and do your best to just get them out because you're not probably going to turn them around. Now I go to the middle. 50% of the workforce last year was on the fence. They could be easily swayed to be more actively engaged, and they could be easily swayed to be disengaged. That's the bulk of your staff and what you do every day to engage those employees, show how much you appreciate them, invest in their development, invest in their well-being, understand where they are on the need spectrum. That's what's going to make the difference of whether they go conditionally or excuse me, actively engaged or they go to the other side. So it's really, really important. So now let's look at stages of team development. Another old, old study, um, but still very relevant today. And this is about understanding where your team is and where they are in conflict. And every single team goes through these stages and every single team goes in and out of these stages based on changes. So for instance, if you're leading an intact work team and you lose somebody, and you add a new employee to the team, you are going to slip back into the first stage of team development. If you're forming a new team, maybe you're taking on a project, and I'll say an easy project like planning the company picnic, you are going to go through these stages of team development with that team. And if you're a, a person looking at new leadership, that's usually one of the first things you do is take on a company project, whether it be a fun one like a picnic, which by the way, if you're working with a lot of difficult personalities. That is not any picnic. <laughs> Planning the company picnic could end up being a nightmare. Um, or you may be asked to take on something uh, a little more company work oriented, like helping lead a new uh, technology or developing a new process or way of doing something. Either way, your team's going to go through these stages. And those stages are forming, storming, norming, and performing. So the first stage, forming, happens when you are coming together or somebody new is coming to the team. When this happens, there's a lot of uh, exploration going on, people getting to know each other. Um, inclusion becomes really important, particularly if you're in a sales environment and you've added a new producer, a new agent. Um, now people are wondering about territories, comp, is this going to take from me? Is it going to give to me? All those things in either way, your productivity has gone down. You're just not as good as you probably have been um, before you added or lost or added that team member. So for the leader, what you need to do when the team is in a forming stage, first of all, set the ground rule, rules. As easy as if you're going to run your first meeting, create an agenda, set up front who you expect to participate. Is there pre-work? Make sure the team knows what you expect as the leader and make time to get to know each other. 
uh, set time to um, reintroduce everybody. Even if you've got somebody that's maybe been with your agency or your company 30 years, the person just coming on doesn't know. So level set and make everybody have to do the same thing. Like two truths and a lie is a great exercise for this. Have everybody tell two truths about themselves, one lie, and have everybody have to guess. I guarantee you people on the team who've been working together for a while may learn new things. And then foster open and honest communication. Make sure everyone participates. Uh, if you've got some quiet people um, or some skeptics, meet with them on the side, but just make sure everyone's being open and honest about the way they're feeling. Um, you can't go to the next stage until you've fully done all these things in the first stage. So you've got to help people do all these things informing before you get to the next stage. And it's important to recognize that the second part of team dynamics uh, is storming and it's very normal. And again, I'm gonna use the example of the company picnic. This could happen in your first meeting. Um, you could have some people who've been around for a while and are tired of the hot picnic and being outside in the sun um, and wanna go somewhere in the shade, wanna do something inside. And there could be strong disagreement on that fact because you've got employees who work inside all day long and they don't care how hot it is, they want the picnic and the activity to be outside. On the work front, this also happens when there's competition, again, for territory, or maybe even someone feels threatened that they used to be the one that looked like they knew everything and now Hotshot we just hired um, is coming in with expertise and the boss seems to wanna to listen to all their new and exciting ideas. So you're having issues of control, power, maybe some autonomy issues, those kinds of things. As a leader, when this is happening, the best thing you can do, and this is the hardest thing, is stand back and let it unfold. Um, address issues one-on-one, -on -one, or ideally have people address it peer-to-peer, -peer, and then keep assessing. So it's really important. You can't ignore storming. It's going to happen. Conflict builds trust if it's handled well. Um, people build respect, all of those things. So as the leader, you just got to, in some ways, let it happen, but not get too unproductive. Once we've gone through those two early phases, we can then get to norming. This is when you will start seeing cohesion, trust building, and again, appreciation of differences in expertise fully across the board. Everyone on the team is starting to feel heard, be heard, respected, all those things. As the leader, it's important we listen, we don't we let the team do the work um, and we stand back still some more, listen, encourage. Your primary role is to facilitate. What can happen during norming is groupthink, where we all start thinking the same thing. So challenge differences, challenge new thinking. Uh, make sure it's not getting into just a, we're all doing this because we want to just go with the norm and where the group's taking us. Um, and make sure that people aren't just being polite. Make sure that there is a healthy dose of conflict. When you've done that, you can actually reach performing. And that's when you are in harmony. You're at the ultimate productivity. Everyone works together to solve problems because we're open with our opinions. We get facts and data behind. We analyze things together. We're making decisions together. We trust each other's opinions, all of those things. And this is at the point, leader, where you can coach, develop, see who's rising to the top who's taking the lead, that's when you're starting to identify who may be ready for the next step, who's emerging. So it's really important we understand Maslow, where our team is, because when you've got those points met where people are at their highest level of needs and your team's at ultimate performance, that's when you can start playing around with, do I start switching seats? Do I start moving people up or moving them over to other functions? So now let's talk about the leader's role in doing that. Uh, I got some more staggering data to start with. I always like to, to show the bad news first because it kind of builds the case for why these things matter. So if for those of you who said, you know, you're individual contributor now and maybe you're thinking about going into leadership, the hard cold truth is that 60 percent of new leaders fail in their first assignment, their first two years. I'm here to tell you that the very first time I got made a team leader, I was so excited. I knew I wanted to be in leadership my whole life. I've always wanted to be in charge. I was a student leader in school. You know, I was one of those, again, just kind of a nerd. Um, but when I got into business and got my first shot, I was very earnest. I got some great advice. I did get help in coaching. But unfortunately, my team did get cut. My team literally got cut. 
And now I look back and understand some of the pieces I did that contributed to that. Um, and I learned from it. So 60% of us may fail at our first leadership experience. 85% of managers receive no formal training. So first of all, it's great you're here because this is some training. You're getting some tips, you're getting some tools and strategies, um, and you've got a network. Pay attention to who's here. If you know each other, network with each other. You don't necessarily need extremely formal training. You don't need to go to a two-week class or get an MBA in management, um, but get some formal training, whether you're given it or you have to go find it yourself. Organizations also fail to pick high talented candidates right for leadership 82% of the time. Why do you think that happens? What are we most often likely to do when we put someone in a leadership role? Who do we look at? See if anyone's still listening, put it in the chat. The top performer, exactly. We usually take the person who's best at the job and just assume they can lead people. And oftentimes they can't. Um, oftentimes they might not want to or don't like doing it. They're really good at, at just doing it. Um, and I think it's really important that we as leaders of organizations make sure that we've got career paths and can help people make self-actualization by being expert in their roles and not having to be leaders. So you can give people new teams, new territories, new businesses, other things to run and lead besides people if they're wanting more in their career. So think about that. Make sure whoever you hire wants to be a leader, is capable of being a leader, and has those traits, not just the, not just the top performing traits of the job itself. Now, doing, being able to do the job that they're leading is key. So you can't not be good at your job, um, but you don't necessarily have to be the best one on the team at it. Uh, it's more important. There are some other things that are more important. So we'll get into that. Um, and this involves moving from me to we. So before you're a leader, success is all about yourself, growing yourself. Once you become a leader, success is all about growing others and your people's success. So one of the key things is to just flip that paradigm when you move into a leadership position. It is no longer about you. The best advice I got when I started and I became a sales leader after the first team fail, I went at it again and I got a sales management position. And the best advice I got was I was a very successful salesperson and I was told by my leader at the time, nobody on your team is going to do it exactly the way you did it. But as long as they get to the outcome, they don't hurt anybody in the process or damage the image of our company or our clients, then it's OK. They don't have to do it exactly the way you did it. So respect them, respect the way they get there um, and grow. You know, your success, your happiness should now come in helping them be successful. And I failed to put the uh, quote, uh, the person who quoted this, but it was Jack Welch, the former leader of GE and one of those leader gurus. So. Let's talk about leaders versus managers. I have a whole webinar on the difference between leadership versus management. Um, and oftentimes, and um, particularly in insurance agencies, we wear a lot of hats and we're not large enough um, or don't have a large enough team where we can have an inspirational, visionary leader and a manager that takes care of more of the holding people to do something. So leaders inspire people. They're more visionary, inspirational. Um, they can get a team of, you know, team of people to take the hill and be excited about doing that. Managers make sure that people have all the tools and the resources and the skills to take the hill and that they do take the hill. They hold them accountable for taking the hill. They give them feedback on how well they're taking the hill and they get them to the hill. So managers are more tacticians, tactical, hands on getting it done. Leaders are more inspirational. And frankly, in this day and age, if you work for a small or mid-sized business, you've got to do both. You've got to be good at both. So the difference in traits. Leadership is about vision, inspiration, challenging people to go above and beyond, bring out the best in themselves, really strong communicators, able to help people see that big picture. Leaders ask the what and the why. You know, what needs to get done? And the context, the why is it important? What's going on in our industry? Why does it matter? What do people need to do? What do I need to put in place so they can do it? On the next level, managers focus on execution. They are more directive, telling people how to get things done. Process oriented. So 
figuring out and making sure we've got the resources, the systems, the tools, and the processes in place to get it done, and the people focus to get it done. Managers are very results driven. In a leader's role, you might be more entrepreneurial, thinking about what's next, what's on the horizon, taking your team to new frontiers with tech technologies, all those things. The manager role is going to be focused more on getting to the results and the end game. Uh, and again, a manager's thinking how and when. So leader asking what and why, manager going, how are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? And how do I make sure people get there when we need them to get there? So I hope that's helpful because those are two different things. And again, as leaders going into a leadership role, we really need to, we need to do both. So now let's get into traits and how traits play into this. So if you're familiar with Amia, you know that we have a behavioral assessment. So that's what I'm going to talk about when it comes to personality. Um, any assessment tool, though, that measures behavioral um, aspects um, have, have some of these elements. So I'm going to keep a high level because this is not an Amia client presentation. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a webinar to help you be a better leader or figure out your next step in going into a leadership role. But there are key traits that matter. So our assessment looks at four key personality traits, level of assertiveness, communication style, pace, uh, the pace at which one prefers to work and their adaptability to change an environment and the speed at which they want to do that. And then the level of structure needed in a job, needed in their role, desired in their role. Your traits are your natural resting spot. It's what you are, are natural at doing with your friends, doing with your colleagues at the pub. They don't, it doesn't mean that you can't be other things, but it's not where you're going to fall in a situation when you're under stress, extremely tired, or super relaxed. It's your natural, natural state. So let's get into them just a little bit in the context of leadership. That's great. I'm glad. I thought we had some uh, assessment takers on this, so you'll know what I'm talking about, and hopefully this will, this will help in the context of leadership. So we measure everything by columns, and the first trait that I, I will talk about is levels of assertiveness, and I'm going to talk about it in extremes. So an extremely assertive person, because we can have people who are more in the middle um, or just slightly higher, um, but you are usually higher um, in one trait than the other. Very rarely are you balanced across every single trait. So I'm going to talk in extremes. A high column one assertiveness is very competitive, uh, good at self-starting, enjoys a challenge, um, very risk, uh, able to take risk, fine with taking risks, um, and very much a me-oriented individual. A highly column two, a high column two, excuse me, is hugely we-oriented, very supportive, team-oriented, collaborative, helpful, and much more risk averse. I will say in leadership, it is important and helpful if your column one is higher, if you are more assertive. It is a primary trait in a leadership role. And why is that? Because when you become a leader who has to uh, hire people, it also means you're a leader who has to fire people. And so you've got to have the level of assertiveness and the confidence in yourself and the ability to handle conflict and have those tough conversations. That's really what it comes down to. Someone who has a very um, high column two, less level of assertiveness, um, that would be the worst day in their life. Now, I'm not saying that as a leader, you ever enjoy doing that. If you do, I'd have, you know, maybe get, take some uh, time off and, and, and get some empathy back because you've become desensitized. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, great, I get to give somebody feedback today or have a conflict. But if you have a high column two, that act, level of activity um, could lead you to some extreme stress, maybe even sickness um, on the extreme. It would just be something that could take you out for weeks if you had to do it. Where a high column one, it's not going to. You won't necessarily like it, but you'll get on with your life quickly afterwards. Communication style um, doesn't make as much of a difference, but it's a really important thing to understand when it comes to your traits and the traits of your team. So someone with a high column three is extremely relational, social, loves people, naturally um, feeling oriented, comfortable up in front of people, comfortable, uh, I like to say spitballing, brainstorming, throwing out ideas, and really don't care if they stick or not. Um, just totally fine with being intuitive, go by the gut. Um, also thrive on being liked. 
um, and being recognized. And that's something keen to point out, because when you're a leadership, you aren't necessarily liked. You're respected, but you're not liked. So it is important that um, your level of assertiveness is higher than your need to be liked. Those that column one has to be col higher than column three. If you have a higher column three than you do a column one, you may be making some poor decisions just because you want um, your team to like you and love you. Really, you want your team to love you. Let's just be honest. Um, and I struggle with that. So I then they're done that. I'm a high column three. Um, but it is really important that people respect more than they like like you sometimes in different situations in business. You can be a great leader, though, if you have a high column four. Um, high column fours are great listeners, good observers. Um, column fours don't speak before they think like a column three person. Um, you're looking at the data, the facts, um, making very objective decisions. The only thing that can hold a column four back is how comfortable you feel about speaking in public. Because as a leader, you are going to have to lead team meetings. You're going to have to set the agenda. You're going to have to be up front. So as long as you got enough column three in you to make yourself comfortable, that you're comfortable around people, comfortable leading the charge, you will be just fine. The only thing I would say is recognize that that may still exhaust you. Um, a high column four could not do four of what I'm doing today. Um, I'm actually going and running our all company meeting as soon as I get off this webinar. And that will be energizing to me. I won't need a nap. I could go to a happy hour tonight afterwards. Um, that's a high column three. A high column four after a webinar or an all company meeting might need to go out for a 30 minute walk, read something, have some downtime, definitely have some alone time. So just know yourself and where you are in your competence and your confidence. Moving on to the uh, fourth trait, or excuse me, third trait, columns five and six, pace and adaptability. Again, not a really important differentiator in being a leader, um, but knowing yourself and knowing your team is really important. A high column five loves variety, multitasking, easily to handle interruptions. So yeah, as a leader of a big team, by the way, one of the questions was how big should my team be? Um, seven to nine is the ideal because you need to be there when your people need you. And if you have more than that, it's really hard to be doing your job, leading from the front, doing all those visionary and managerial things and taking care of your team. Um, and as a leader, I mean, I just got texted while I'm doing this. Your people need you. You need to be there for them. And the more you can multitask, um, handle those interruptions and be there for your people, it's key. There's also folks that really need routine and like to do methodical tasks, prefer doing one thing at a time, can get stressed with change. Now, if you are an extreme column six, being in a leadership role, taking care of seven to nine people a day and running a function, running your job could be hard. You may not want to go into leadership if, if you're a high column six. But if you're in the middle, you, you're able to do both. And there are some strengths with come along again with being more routine oriented, methodical. You're going to be consistent with your people. You're going to be consistent with one-on-ones, company meetings, showing up and following through. A high column five could come up with 10 new ideas after 10 o'clock, forgetting that they already gave their team three things to do at eight that morning. So there's some risks on both of these. Again, I could do a whole session on column five and column six when it comes to leadership. Column seven and eight is the need for structure. And again, we can see strong leaders in both, but there are some nuances here. High column sevens are very big picture oriented. So they are more uh, natural visionaries, natural entrepreneurial, um, out there on the edge coming up with new ideas. Done is better than perfect for a high column seven, making quick decisions, having independence and autonomy really works well for a column seven, having the freedom to do their job um, and the freedom to make decisions on their own. High column sevens are also hugely resilient. So if they make a mistake or fail at that first leadership role, they're willing, they're able to pick themselves back up. So you can see all those things would be important to being a leader. On the flip side, columns eight are more of your perfectionist, detailed, accurate, really enjoy getting things perfect and will make sure they're perfect, <laughs> go to the extremes to be perfect. The downside is they can be reluctant delegators and leadership is all about delegating and getting things done through others. Um, I used to work uh, with, a, with a, a colleague who was a high column eight and she was a phenomenal leader. Um, and what she would say though is she had to have full and complete trust before she would delegate. 
And she was very good at leading people who were expert in the same thing she was expert in. She never would have wanted to have to lead a sales team that all get through things differently and are very assertive and um, very aggressive and maybe hard to manage because they're all over the place or demanding all those things. But a high column eight could easily manage uh, an expert in their experts that they're already expert in. So accountants, think about a CFO, probably a high column eight um, and can be a very great leader. Um, the head of your accounting department, um, the head of your uh, risk um, uh, claims, those kinds of things where that detail, that perfection is important. But as long as they have enough assertiveness, they can lead that team that's very similar. So I have been talking a lot about traits. If you have any questions about traits, please put them in there. I'm curious if those of you who've taken the assessment, if anything has resonated with you. And if you've got a trait, you're curious about whether or not um, it's going to affect your ability to lead others successfully. We have 17 different personality traits at AMIA that our assessments have, have, have developed over the years. Um, 17 different personalities. I will say, there's not one of these that can't be a leader. There are some though that would struggle more or maybe have more stress going into a leadership role. So again, if you're any of these, and even if you just wanna contact me separately, I'd love to talk, talk more to you um, about this or our team is always here to help. I'm going to do something real quick. For those of you who never have taken the assessment, we always offer every company one complimentary one. So there's a, um, a try it link, but I've just put it in the chat. All right, I'm gonna uh, wrap us up now with some strategies and what this all means. So as leaders, the key is understanding yourself and understanding your people. You cannot take a one size fits all approach. So you need to understand how the people on your team are motivated and understand yourself, how you're motivated. Um, so again, factor in level of assertiveness, cautiousness. What is your communication style? What's the communication style of the people on your team? If you have a high number of column fours on your team and you run your first your first team meeting and nobody speaks up, don't think it's about you. They're not comfortable at speaking up. You may have to run your meetings differently. You may have to send out questions in advance. You may have to do more surveys or individual conversations than all hands meetings if you want people to speak up. So that's just an example understanding people's pace, need for structure, level of autonomy, and how they want to be recognized are all critical. So, oops, I'm sorry, that was not a link. I will um, get you that in just a moment. Um, in fact, let me make sure, I, I'm gonna try that one more time. It might be you need to hit control, click, but I'll make sure I just put it in here real quick. This is me multitasking. Now it should work. <laughs> All right. And feel free to take it and multitask, but I would recommend you do it when you're not doing something else because you'll get the most accurate data if you take. It takes 10 to 12 minutes. So afterwards, go grab a cup of coffee and then um, take it because you'll get more accurate results. So the leader's role. The key thing you need to do on a, um, as a leader are these key things to drive that engagement, help your team through. First and foremost, building trust. Your actions must match your words. You can't just say it um, and not do it. And that comes to all things, by the way. If you say you uh, believe in work-life balance and you send emails on the weekends, um, not good. Or if you say, I, expect, I don't want anybody to work from their PTO, I want you to take time off and you go on vacation and send emails or send a report or send an update, your actions aren't matching your words. So it's not just about your integrity of the work you get done, it's also how, how you live out values. Communicating is not just about talking, it is about listening. Collaboration is all about leveraging each and everyone's individual strengths. Empowering, and I have a whole empowerment model I'll cover in just a moment, is developing your employees to delegate because once you become a leader, you're not supposed to be spending most of your time doing the actual work. You're supposed to be leading the work and getting others to do the work. And that can be one of the hardest things to get into. And then inspecting. You really do have to hold people accountable. 
Um, it's really important that you trust, but one of my favorite phrases is trust and verify. So every now and then, make sure you go in and inspect the work and how it's getting done and catch people doing something good and let them know that they've done something good. And if they haven't, then give them that feedback and let them know you're observing, you're watching. And again, it's in the spirit of growing and developing your team. Um, I'm going to flip by this one quickly because I've already made the case and I'm, I'm sensitive to the time. Um, but this is a nice visual that you'll see in the recording or get in the download. Um, again, about why driving engagement is so important and how it's important to create individualism, independent teams. So as a leader, the very first thing you must have, and, and I think a lot of leaders make the mistake of thinking this only comes from the top, the CEO, but in any team, a team of two people, there needs to be vision. So it's the beginning of the year right now. Be thinking if you haven't yet, what is the vision for your, com for your company, your team, your department, your function, the picnic? What's the vision of the picnic? Is it that everyone comes and everyone enjoys it and everyone has a good time and people share and laugh? That's a vision. So have a vision clear in your head of where you're headed with this group of people you're working with and leading. And then you need strategies to get there. So vision is one thing, but if you don't have a strategy and a plan and objectives and goals, you're not going to do it. And then think about the way you get there. It's one thing to set a core of values, but it's the people that actually play out the values. So um, I like to say culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, I didn't coin that. It's another uh, well-coined phrase. Um, but your people and the way things get done um, will make the difference. And you set the tone for the culture. Um, and then you find the other people that are the, uh, what I like to call informal leaders. Who do people follow? Who do people watch? Are they embodying the values and the goals um, that you want them to emulate? You want your team to be all about. I said already, you've got to set goals. You've got to set as many numerical, quantitative, smart goals. Um, I did a whole webinar last week. You can find it on our website um, on goal setting. So if you're new at leadership and you want to look at how you set goals for your team and yourself, check that out. Um, and then investment. Investment in yourself and investment in your team is really critical. So making sure you're developing your team. Even if you have a low budget, you can find free webinars. Um, you can join associations like MSO and be part of groups that um, provide, provide such things and help your teams do the same. To engage, this is key, and this is more on the, the human side of everything. The number one way and the best way a leader can engage is showing empathy, really understanding. And that goes back to those Maslow's needs, um, understanding where your team is, understanding what's going on in their life. You know, what's important to one employee last year might not be the same thing this year. I'll give you an example. Maybe you had somebody who wanted to earn as much as they could. So you gave them some great incentives around um around, you know, achieving certain KPIs or sales or um, low, you know, low errors, anything, and you gave them more cash. And that mattered because they wanted a new car or they were buying a new house or getting married. Well, guess what? Now they're married. Uh, they got the house. Maybe they're getting ready to have a baby. Their goals may be very different. They may not want so much money, but time is more important. So empathizing with where your people are and being transparent about what's important and having an environment where people feel free to talk about that and you value where they are and what's important is so key. So that listening and nurturing that environment. And guess what? It means you share too. So um, you don't have to overshare about your life, but letting people know your wins, your struggles, that you don't have all the answers, asking for help, showing people that it's okay to ask for help, or it's also okay to learn from mistakes, be open and transparent about mistakes is really key. We've already talked about the need for recognition, recognizing people is key, and also understanding how they like to be recognized differently. And then anything you can do to create norms and traditions that are unique to your team, your culture, that vision of the company you have are really key. So doing things on a, a routine and regular and consistent basis like team meetings, parties, get-togethers, um, PTO schedules, holidays, you recognize any of those traditions, really form culture and help you engage. Communication is key. Tailoring your touch points is significant. So again, knowing their personalities and how they prefer to communicate. If I have someone that's more um, 
analytical, reserved, cautious. And if I just call them up and say, hey, do you have a second? Or I send them an email and say, can you call me? The first thing they're going to think is they're in trouble. I don't want to talk to the boss. They're going to have dread. But somebody else doesn't want to get a three page email from me and when it could have been a phone call. So knowing that and how people like to talk is really key. And then being consistent, transparent and and always giving context. If you ask a question of anybody or you give feedback, give context of why you're asking, how you got the information, where it came from. It's less off putting and really helps people feel feel more worthy or more worth in driving team engagement. Avoiding the halo effect, that means just because somebody's good at one thing doesn't mean they'll be good at another. So be careful to not set up people for um, failure uh, unnecessarily. Like I said, the best person on the job doesn't mean they'll be the best at leading the team. That's a perfect example of the halo effect. Another key thing is really encouraging direct team feedback. Um, my team would tell you if they were on the call how much I talk about this one. Um, as a leader, you are always going to get people that want to come up to you with the problem, give you the problem and ask you to solve the problem. And that is not what's going to drive an independent collaborative team. So when someone comes to you with a complaint about something, whether it be a work issue that's causing them a problem, a process that's broken down, or more than likely it's going to be about someone else's actions or behaviors, the first question should be, have you talked to them about this? And have you given them the skills to talk to them about that? Because that's much more personal and it'll be handled. And no one should know that that employee ever came to talk to you about it. If it can be handled peer to peer, it's key um, and give your people the skills to do so. Um, if you find that it's happening more regularly, consistently, the person has talked to them and this problem's not getting solved, that's when you get involved. But you've got a paper trail and documentation that shows you that. I got asked about remote and hybrid. And um, it's really important that you use collaboration tools. If you've got a hybrid workforce or maybe you've got people in your office and people who are working at home or on other sites or any of that, and maybe it varies by day, by week, by month. So collaboration tools are key. And there's a new term that's coming up that I think is getting real prevalent is proximity bias. So make sure, again, you're not giving more attention, more focus, more love or more projects, assignments, recognition to the people who you're closer with um, by proximity and those who are away. You really got to be mindful of that in a um, hybrid environment. Continuous pulsing, you constantly got to stay in touch, in touch with your team. At the organization level, you do it anonymous, anonymously. You also do it in the form of all company meetings. As, an, as a leader of a smaller intact team, that one-on-one -on -one goes a long way and clearing hearts and minds. So have regular check-ins and make sure those regular check-ins aren't always about the work. It should be about getting to know what's going on in the person's life, where are they at in their development, what do they want more of, less of, all those kinds of things will grow. And then finally, I've got one last thing to talk about um, that's so key when it comes to becoming a leader and really thinking about driving a, a high-performing team, and that's empowerment. And empowerment is all about delegating and getting work things done through others, but it but you don't do it all at once. So I use this model to show us in thinking through the importance of the person's skill level, the seriousness of the consequence, and the level of empowerment you're going to give. So just to clear this, on the left represents how skilled is the individual. And that means how long have they been in the role? How much, how good is their experience? Have they made some mistakes and learned from them and you've seen improvement? The more you can say yes to those things and the higher the numbers get, the more skilled they would go on the on the scale. And then the other axis is the seriousness of the consequence of what you're going to empower them to do. So when someone is brand new in their role, maybe brand new to your agency, um, they may have no empowerment, especially when it comes to seriousness, the consequences. And I'm just going to use the example of maybe the company credit card. I think we can all relate to uh being able to spend money um, on the company's behalf. If I'm brand new to my role, I've never done this job, I may have no empowerment to spend any money. Um, if I'm fairly new to the role, um, but I've had other experience, I've already managed a team, I've already run events, I've already made financial decisions on behalf of the company, you may give me guidelines. I can spend up to a spend limit on that credit card, or I can make a decision 
on behalf of our, our company on to attend an event or to go to something on my own, but it's within a certain threshold of money. Does that make sense? So the higher the skill level, the seriousness of the consequence and money is always a consequence. So the other example I would give is negotiations. So what's the wiggle room of an employee to negotiate pricing rates, those kinds of things. Um, any kind of variable uh, that affects the business. Again, skill level, seriousness of consequence. There may never be full empowerment. Um, there may always be guidelines in place because you can't afford having your, your employees give away the farm. But once someone's reached a certain level, like the CFO um, or the head of that, a head of your financial department, they may have full empowerment, but there's still accountability, reporting, all those things. It's not like we don't ever look at the balance sheet and what those what um, the impact of those decisions are being made. So let me know if you have any questions about this. This is again something that I could delve into much longer. Um, so I'm going to wrap us up and take your questions. The key is knowing your strengths and traits. I can't say that anymore. So if you haven't ever taken our assessment, take us up on the complimentary. Um, take it, and uh, one of our experts will be in touch with you to debrief your personal results. Get a plan in place, whether that's if you're deciding to be a leader, you started today by attending this webinar, um, give it some thought, decide if it's for you, and then start putting yourself out there. The first time I became a leader, it's because I raised my hand and said, I'm ready. Um, tailoring your approach is key to your success and engaging your team is critical. So one of the things I always love to share is the importance of the heart. And this is one of my favorite quotes, to handle yourself, use your head, to handle others, use your heart. I've tried to give you a balance today of the business side and the business aspects of being a leader, but so much of it is understanding your people, where they are, listening to them, engaging them in that importance. Are there any questions for me before we wrap? And thank you all for attending. Oh, you see my cat in the background, thank you. Thank you all. I um, did have some questions. So if your question didn't get answered, like what do I do in my next phase of retirement or are there any specific industry trends in insurance? You have my contact information. Please give me a call. Please send me an email, whatever. I'm happy to meet any questions that I didn't get to, um, but I did my best to meet the general ones. Thank you all so much for participating today. I really enjoyed it and I appreciate your interaction. Best wishes to you and your leadership success and your company's success. Happy 2024.